All right. Well, I am Lynn Howard, and I'm the Director for Medical Student Recruitment up here at the Elson S. Floyd College of Medicine. Uh, part of my job is to go around, in fact, the bulk of my job and my most pleasant part of my job is to go around and talk to the different clubs, different admissions offices, and students who are interested in applying to medical school. Uh, I understand that your club is kind of a, com a combination of people who are interested in um, different health sciences, not just medicine. And so I'm not sure how many of you are interested in medical school, but uh, for those that are interested in other professional programs, there's some information that kind of crosses the line with other schools as well. And that's um, you know kind of what to look for in your applications and how to prepare for those professional schools as well. Uh, I'm not married to just doing the slides today. If you want to interrupt me, you are welcome to for questions. Uh, it is difficult for me to see if you raise your hand because I can only see a few boxes at a time while I'm sharing my slides. Um, so if you do have a question, you can unmute and just say, excuse me, or you can um, wait until the end because I think the presentation answers quite a few questions. Uh, or if someone would be willing to monitor the chat box for me because I do not have Maura here with me today, which I normally do. Um, and she normally interrupts me when I have a message in the chat. So uh, if someone would like to volunteer for that, I would super appreciate that. Yeah, we got, a, we got Destiny monitoring the chat for us right now. Perfect, all right. Well, what I do is I just run through a lot of the things that we are actually looking for in our applications, in our applicants and kind of tell you what we expect, how we look at the applications, what our timeline is. I answer just about uh, all of the basic questions that people have. So hopefully I'll get through it pretty quick and then it'll lay, leave some time at the end for specific questions that maybe I didn't cover or that may be in your situations um, that, that weren't covered with my slideshow. We're gonna go over our prereqs, how we look at the MCAT, how we look at your GPA, our secondary questions, um, what our interview cycle looks like and our um, admission cycle and how we screen your, uh, screen your applications and how they move through our system. And then I'll talk a little bit about our student class demographics so that you can show that we um, are managing to accomplish what we set out to accomplish by actually not looking at the stats coming in. So I think it gives people a lot of pause and it gives them a lot of hope in knowing that we don't rely so much on the MCAT and the GPA going forward. So first and foremost, I'm gonna tell you if you're applying to a professional school of any kind, you really need to know the mission and vision of the school that you're applying to. And the reason that that's so important is because most of the time, typically, but medical schools for sure, they are looking for applicants that are lined up with their mission and vision, that they are doing experiences that fall within that mission and vision for their school. That is how you will be more competitive for each of those schools is to line up with their mission. And we are, no exception to that rule for sure. Our mission for our school is to solve problems in challenging healthcare environments across the state of Washington. And that across the state of Washington is a big important piece. When we applied to be a medical school, we promised the legislature that we would recruit from the state of Washington or, or by those who have ties to the state of Washington for the sole reason that statistically, it is the best way to increase the number of physicians within your state is if you recruit from your state. So Washington State as a whole is very, very short on physicians. It's getting worse. Our physician um, population is aging out. And the only um, county in the entire state of Washington that has enough physicians per capita is, sure you know, King County. So that's where the big hospital systems are over there in Seattle. So um, our goal is to try to increase the physician numbers in the state of Washington. We don't have any ties to saying you have to practice primary care or family medicine. We don't have anything saying that you have to practice medicine in a rural environment. What we want you to do is to be and have a put at least part of your practice and your time in either rural or underserved vulnerable communities. So that can be in an urban area. We're just hoping that you'll help us solve some of the medical crises and healthcare access crises in those vulnerable and rural populations. So some of the goals that fall underneath that mission are that we are looking for students who are interested in those particular populations, that you're informed of the communities that you are living in or that you plan to practice in, because we are a community-based medical school, which means we do not have our own hospital tied to our school. 
So all of your clinical experiences are done out in the community hospitals and clinics. Um, and that all depends on which site that you are spending your third and fourth year in. But for the first two years when you're in Spokane, your clinic time is going to be in the um, hospitals and clinic systems around the, the Spokane area. And that's what makes it a community-based uh, medical school. So if you are unaware of what's going on in your community, you likely won't need to know what the needs are. So we want you to get out in those communities and spend time there and um, recognize where the challenges are. <clears throat> we do require biology, physics, and organic chemistry, all with the lab, four semester hours of each or six quarter hours. So if you have done Running Start and you did it at a community college or you did it at a college that has quarter hours, you're, we're looking for those six quarter hours will be equivalent to the four semester hours. We accept um, the prerequisites from community colleges, four-year colleges, four-year universities. We accept online uh, credits as well, as long as they have come from an accredited school. So um, that's a good thing because last year, of course, we all know that every school in the world went to online learning. And um, we have not actually changed that. We've always accepted our prereqs online if that is where uh, an applicant took them. You need to have a grade of a C or better. So any level of C or better on your prerequisites. Uh, the only exception to that is during COVID, we made an exception for the spring and summer of 2020 because a lot of schools, when they had to switch midterm over to the online learning, they also went to a pass-fail system. So for any prereqs that were taken during those two semesters or quarters, we will accept a pass-fail grade for those classes. And we'll know the dates, obviously, going forward. It's not like if you're not graduating yet, you're going to have to retake them because it's, not, no, it's no longer 2020. It doesn't work that way. Um, so and if you have any questions about any of that, please you know, let us know. Your bachelor's degree does need to be complete by July 15th of the year that you start school. So if you're applying this cycle, starting in May of this year, um, your bachelor's degree will need to be done by 15 July of 2022 in order to qualify to start medical school. Um, and it can be in any discipline. We do not have any rules on what you major in. In fact, we tell you to major in what you love because you will do better in it if it is something that you are really passionate about and you love. We also wanna make sure that um, you like your degree because you likely will have to get a job in it uh, when in the kind of in the process of applying to medical school, if you take a gap year or two, or if you don't get in your first year that you apply, you wanna make sure that you have a degree in an occupation that you're gonna enjoy doing. Also helps you to be more well-rounded. You're coming in with other experiences other than everyone majoring in the same thing. Now, if you majored in a hard science, biology, chemistry, which are pretty common, that's great too. You'll fill a lot of your prereqs that way and you won't have to take them kind of outside of your degree. Um, but please don't think that you have to take um, certain sciences or have to major in certain sciences. You just have to make sure that you're fulfilling all of the prerequisites. Uh, we normally go back about four years for the MCAT, four years prior to uh, when you start school, medical school. Um, we did go back an extra year during COVID. I am not certain if we are doing that this year. So I would ask you to check our website after April 1st to find out uh, what our thinking on the MCAT dates are for this upcoming cycle. The reason that we had to do it last year was because so many tests um, got canceled or delayed or rescheduled. And there were some people that were going to be right on the edge of um, it. There's um, expiring, so we went back an extra year for that to alleviate some of that. <clears throat> you can take um, the last testing date in September for your MCAT and still qualify by deadlines. I don't strongly suggest that just because it doesn't give you an opportunity to retest if you need to for that cycle. So I usually tell people if you can take it in spring or very early summer, so that you have some leeway if you were to need to retake it. And then as far as how we look at your score, we only look at your highest MCAT score. Our system does, we don't actually see it, but our system looks at your highest score. Um, some schools, they'll look at your very first score. Some look at your most current score. Some average your scores if you had to take it more than once. So as you're going forward, pay attention to that at each school's website as to how they look at their MCAT. For us, highest score doesn't matter where it was in your series. 
in order to receive a secondary from our school, secondary is uh, also called a supplemental application. You'll have your primary application that goes into MCAS. That's the part of your application that goes to every school that you apply for. And your secondary application is school specific. Not every medical school has them, but I'd say the majority of them probably do. Uh, we invite you to fill out ours, and that is because you have to meet certain parameters in order to receive it, in order to qualify to apply to our school. And those are being a US citizen or US permanent resident, meeting three of the four Was from Washington ties that are listed here, or be a resident student of Washington, which basically is being a Washington state resident. So the ties are being born in Washington, having a childhood address in Washington, um, having graduated from Washington High School or that at least one of your parents still currently lives in Washington. Uh, if you meet three or four of those ties, oftentimes you're a resident and vice versa, but it isn't always true. So sometimes people leave for college and they change their residency to get in-state residency wherever they're going to school, but they have all the ties so then they can still apply. You also have to meet one of our three MCAT GPA combination thresholds, and I'll show you those in just a second. All of your letters of recommendation have to have been received in time, and then you have to be 21 years old by graduation of medical school, and that is because uh, national, nationwide you have to be 21 to practice medicine. Uh, the letters of recommendation, we require three. You can submit a fourth, and your three can be in the form of a committee letter, if you want to choose that as all of your um, letters, that's okay, or it can count as just one and you can submit two more. So that's up to you how you go forward with those letters. We, we think about letters a little bit differently. Um, most schools are gonna tell you exactly who they have to come from. Like if you're in school, you have to have one from a professor, it has to be a science professor. Um, we don't do that because we have a lot of non-traditional students applying uh, to our school or career changers. So they may not have been in school for a while. So what we tell you to do is to ask for letters from people who know you well, um, people who can speak to the character traits that are gonna make you a good medical student or they're gonna make you a good physician. Um, I tell people to take a resume of sorts of what you have done to prepare for medical school, as well as at least a, a shell of your personal statement of why you want to be a physician. And that helps them write a more robust letter for you to submit um, also, when you're looking at professors, try to think of professors who either you have um, taken more than one class with, or you were a TA for, maybe you did research with them, someone who knows you well enough, or you just had a class that maybe there was a lot of student and professor interaction, then that might be okay too. But the key is people who have known you well enough that they can speak about your path to medicine. Um, if you have a health profession committee, you can certainly use that. Like I said, it can count as one letter or all four. Be timely when you ask for these letters. Ask for them between uh, April and June. Uh, it is very unprofessional to go to someone and ask them to write a letter and tell them, I need that within two weeks because chances are they're already busy. Their schedules are kind of booked out and they may not submit the letter. And without the right letters, then you won't um, receive the secondary. So you need to make sure that you give them plenty of time. There is a form letter on the AAMC website that I tell people to go ahead and print it out and give it to everybody who you are asking to write your letter. It kind of tells them what to put in a letter for um, medical school in case they've never written one before. And it's it's pretty uh, nice thing to do. It just um, helps them even more to write your letter better. And the hope is that they will include things in your letter, like talking about your academic background. That way professors obviously would do that. Um, your interests and activities. What have you done for community service? Uh, what are some of the life experiences that you have done in order to prepare for medical school? And then maybe they'll talk about your attributes that are going to make you a strong student or a strong physician, like you have really good teamwork or you're very compassionate, you're very ethical. We see a lot of those things in the letters. Um, who can they come from besides your professors? Uh, doctors that you have worked under or volunteered under um, if you haven't done that with a physician and you can get, say, a PA or a nurse practitioner, if that is who was your supervisor in a medical experience, that is okay, too. Um, they're just going to speak to different things than your professors would speak to. If you've been in a paid position for a long time, maybe your supervisor from that. If you did collegiate sports or um, any kind of activities like um, art or dance or music in college, 
the the person that you worked under with that would be a good idea for writing your letters too because they spent a lot of time with you. So if you kind of get the gist, it's people who you spent time with, people who can speak well of you and um, your path for medicine. So those combinations that I talked about, GPA and MCAT, these are what we look at. How we got to these numbers is that we did a research of across the nation of students who um, got into medical school, graduated on time, and were successful in medical school. And that's where these numbers actually came from. So these are actual medical student numbers. And we're doing it way different than any other school is. We're showing you exactly the numbers that you need in order for us to read your secondary. Okay, so they are black and white. There is no gray area, no matter how great your story is. If your GPA and MCAT does not fall into one of these three thresholds, we will not receive your application to be read. So you can go all the way down to 2.6 GPA, 2.6 to 3.39, as long as your MCAT is in the 61st percentile and above. Totally doable, just so you know. If it is 3.4 to 3.79, then you need to be in the 43rd percentile and above a 3.8 is in the 27th percentile. Um, the great thing about how we do this is once you fall into one of these three thresholds, when we actually physically receive your application, we blind both of those numbers. So no person that is screening your application or that is presenting you with the admissions committee and no members of the admission committee get to see what your MCAT or your GPA was. We do that on purpose because we do holistic review and we are looking at your story of why you wanna be a physician, your secondary essays of why our school and what experiences you've had um, in the rural and underserved communities, as well as all those experiences that you did to prepare for medical school and the reflection in them of what you've learned and what you've taken away. And then we decide on how well you fit the mission and vision of our school. And that is actually how we select our students to come in and be part of the class versus oh, well, they have a 3.9 GPA and they got an 85% on their MCAT. They're in like Flint. Doesn't work that way for us. Um, so we think it's a fresh way to look at your package because the, the honest part of this is, is that just having a high GPA and just having a high MCAT score is not gonna make you a good compassionate physician. It can, you can be, but it's not relying on those numbers. What those numbers are telling us is you can study you can do well in your science classes and you will succeed in the academic portion of medical school, which is why we have to look at them initially so that we know how you'll do on your um, uh, board exams and how you'll do on your exams through medical school. But once you fell in there, there's no need for us to look at them again. Uh, we are sharing a secondary question this year. Normally we don't share those, um, but we asked this last cycle if there were any disruptions um, to their application, to their life, personal life, volunteer life, work life uh, that had to do with COVID. And I would expect that to be a question on this year's application as well. It hasn't been 100% decided. However, this year is gonna be actually more impacted than last year was because the shutdown didn't happen until the end of March last year. So most of the people that were applying had done the, the good bulk of, of what they were going to do before that. So. Think about that question. If there were disruptions, if your shadowing got canceled, your volunteer things got canceled, this is where you would put that. And then think about what, what were some of the positives? What were some of the silver linings? Was there anything you were able to do because some of those other things were canceled or instead of those other things? That's a good place to put it, uh, that information as well. You don't have to. This question is optional. It is totally up to you. It is another way for us to get to know kind of how you came into the admission cycle. As far as interviewing goes, we do not fill all of our interview slots until the very last application has crossed, crossed our door. So we don't fill all the slots until after December 1st. Um, there are some schools that will fill all of their class slots and then they will still run interviews and they will tell applicants that they are interviewing solely to be on their wait list. And we don't do that, we never have. We're not, we're not planning on changing that um, process anytime soon because sometimes people have to apply a little bit later in the cycle for various reasons. Maybe they couldn't get into the MCAT or they were waiting on their score. Maybe they were waiting to get an experience completed. Um, so we want, 
that we don't want to uh, have those students who have to apply a little bit later to be any more disadvantaged. So we keep some of our interview slots available um, all the way through the, the deadlines. Now, with that said, is it less um, competitive towards the beginning of the cycle? Only in the fact of numbers. So there's typically less people in the system and there's more interview slots available, but we make sure that we are very careful with how we fill our interview slots. Our deadlines um, have not changed even through COVID. It's 15 October for the primary and one December for the secondary applications. Uh, this last year, everything was pushed back two weeks, not the deadlines, but um, the way in which we received applications due to COVID because MCAS was two, two weeks um, delayed. We are conducting virtual interviews or we did this last year. Uh, it is looking like we're going to be doing virtual interviews for this next cycle as well. It has not been 100% decided. So again, check that website uh, before you apply. Uh, the beauty of being able to do those virtual interviews is that, first of all, it was free, which is a really big bonus for applicants because traveling around for interviews can get quite pricey very quickly. Uh, but we really wanted to make sure that you were safe, that no one felt pressured to travel somewhere in the midst of a pandemic and put themselves at risk. So it really paid off well for everyone. We were considering your safety as well as our faculty and staff safety um, when it came to the interviews. Normally our school does MMIs, multiple mini interviews, but this year uh, we chose not to do that because on Zoom, our multiple mini interviews are a series of seven rooms with a scenario that you read outside the room and then you go inside a room with one interviewer and discuss it for five minutes. And then you would have a, a double-timed interview with an admissions committee member. Um, to finagle a bunch of MMI rooms via Zoom it can be done. We did it for a couple programs this summer, but there's a lot of room for um, anxiousness amongst the applicants with that because you're changing rooms a lot. And then there's a lot of room for technical issues as well. So we chose to not do those this year. We chose to use what's called the VITA. It is a pre-recorded response through the AAMC. If a school is using it and Say we were your first invite for an interview, you would also get an interview uh, invite from the AAMC to complete the VITA recordings. It is a series of six different scenarios uh, that are measuring the attributes that medical schools are looking for. And they'll give you a prompt, you have a little bit of time to write some notes down, and then you record uh, into a recording for three minutes or up to three minutes. Any school that chose to use the VITAs uses that same set of recordings. So you only do it one time for the entire season. Um, and I tell you that because when we went into the season, I think some people didn't know that. Um, and they thought that they would re-record it for each interview that they were invited to do if a school was using the VITAs. And it doesn't work that way. So take the very first time very seriously. You can't really practice for them per se, but, but know that you're given a scenario, you're gonna be able to take notes, take good notes, so that it can be as robust as, as you possibly can that first time through. Uh, we use them, we'll, we, we review them just like we did the MMIs actually, we're looking for attributes within them. And then on interview day for us, we had two live one-on-one uh, -on -one Zoom interviews that were 10 minutes each. One is with an admissions committee member and then one is with another trained interviewer, which may or may not be an admissions committee member. Um, and those are more open-ended questions, you know, why medicine, why our school, um, those kind of things. So we can get to know you a little bit through that. And then we have a lot of um, presentations for the day. It's, it's kind of an all day thing when you come to interview, even though it's virtual. <clears throat> okay, and I already talked about kind of the holistic review of your application and how we look at that. The experiences that we are requiring or that we are looking for in our applications are experience with rural or underserved communities. And you'll notice that that doesn't say it has to be in medicine. So if your passion is to serve the homeless population, that's an underserved community. So it doesn't have to be a medical experience. It can be if you volunteered in a free clinic, that's gonna fall under underserved and it's gonna fall under clinic exposure. Um, if you served uh, meals at a homeless shelter, it's gonna fall under underserved and under community service. So you can fill two of those things at the same time. And what I tell people to do is see where your gaps are. Where do you need the experience? Where can you double up? Um, clinic exposure for us is a little different than some schools. A lot of schools have very specific, and I apologize for the sun, it's 
I can't do much about it right this very second. It's coming through my, um, my living room windows. Um, we don't have hours attached to how much clinical exposure that you have. We are looking more for the quality of what you did and kind of think of patient interaction, interaction with the physician themselves, um, being in an environment where you could observe how the team works together, the healthcare team. Um, and then uh, we, we really like to see that you have spent enough time in a medical environment to make sure you're making an informed decision to go into medicine. Um, don't take it lighthearted. Uh, there are a lot of schools though that require, you know, specifically 40 hours of shadowing and maybe a hundred hours in community service that is medical related. We don't do that. We put it all in one category because not everyone has the same opportunities and we know it. And that's why we do it. So as you're getting those clinical exposures and um, as you're getting some experience in, in underserved communities or rural communities, think about healthcare bar barriers. Think about lack of access to care. What are some of the health disparities that these communities are bringing in or that they experience? What are the challenges that they face? Because what we're actually looking for is not just that you spent time in these environments, but that you can be reflective of what you learned or took away, or maybe it changed your perspective about something. Um, our hope is that our medical students will come in and they will have had enough time in one of these communities to help us to solve some of the crises that are taking place across the state or help us to solve some of those challenges that these communities are facing. And then our other category, uh, other than the non-healthcare community service, which that can be underserved or can just be something that you really enjoy doing in your community, that's okay too. Um, but experience beyond the classroom is everything that doesn't fall in the first three categories. That's the best way to put it. That will make you a well-rounded applicant and kind of um, tell us more about who you are. So think about cultural experiences, mission trips, studying abroad, any of the arts. Uh, if you worked while you were in college, if even if it's not medical, it had better be on your application because it tells us what you had to do with your time. Also, we get attributes from some of those. If you had to work while you were in school, you probably have some pretty good time management skills. Um, you may have a little bit more grit because you've had to balance work and school. Um, typically, you uh, have transferable skills from those working um, experiences that you've had. Customer service, any kind of customer service that you've done, your patients are customers. So you can relate to what you had to learn about customer service and tie that into being a physician and treating patients. Um, hobbies, passions outside of academics and entrepreneurship. Hobbies is something that uh, I have heard people say, well, I've been told not to put hobbies on my application because it's just fluff. Well, it's not fluff if you word it right for one thing, but more in that, than that, it's not fluff in that it shows us that you have a life outside of school and outside of work and that you have something to turn to for balance and for self-care and to make sure that, you know, as you come into medical school that you have a healthy uh, set of something to, to turn to instead of unhealthy coping mechanisms like not sleeping or drinking alcohol or there's lots of them that I won't go into that would be coping mechanisms for, for some. So we wanna know that you have a healthy coping me mechanism in place. So if you have a tough week in school, you've got something to turn to. If you have a tough week in clinic, you've got something to turn to. And uh, as you'll see here, one of the attributes that we look for is ethical responsibility to yourself and others. A lot of people kind of glaze over that to yourself piece. And that is where we're looking for that self-care and well-roundedness. In collaboration, communication, interpersonal skills, these are common amongst all medical schools. Uh, intellectual excellence is telling us how, uh, how you succeeded in your classes. We do see your grades on your transcript, we just don't see your GPA. Um, or if you had a rough spot in college, but you overcame it and your grades ended up well, or you had a positive grade trend. Sorry, my dog's right next to me. Um, also, I see that it, sometimes in research too, of having to kind of think outside the box with research. Um, resiliency and adaptability, we see that in lots of, of different areas. Oftentimes you may see a question on a secondary concerning that, but we also see it if, if you didn't work while you were in school, you're probably gonna be pretty adaptable and you're probably gonna be pretty resilient. Um, if you did research, one thing about research that we know is you will, you will have failures in research. That is what research is. It doesn't always work the very first time around. So it's the ability to pick back up, start over, pick back up, start over. Um, so it shows us that you can do that because you're going to have some days in medical school that you may have to pick back up and start over. 
So that's why we look for some of those things. As far as COVID-19 goes and applying to medical school, um, remember we're looking for your quality versus your quantity, but we still are gonna expect those hours in those different areas. Um, and we're looking for reflection. Please, please, please reflect in your application of what you learned and took away. You can project out hours on an application, you can project all the way up until matriculation. So say you just started an experience this month and you plan to continue it until you start medical school. You would put your end date as like August 1st of 2022. That'll tell us I'm still, you're still gonna do that. You're gonna obtain more hours. You're gonna get more experience. And then maybe if you're not interviewing until later in the cycle, that's something you can bring up. I have a lot more experience in this um, particular uh, experience that I chose now, I have a lot more hours in it, and I've learned a lot more things with it. It's a good opportunity to bring it out um, is in an interview. So what can you do now because of COVID? Because we know that it's really difficult to get uh, volunteer hours and things. Virtual shadowing is a huge, huge thing right now. Um, I suggest that you do it if you can't get shadowing somewhere else. If you can get real shadowing, by all means, get as much as you can. Um, the virtual shadowing is I think a lot of schools are gonna look at it because it is one of the only opportunities right now. And um, what I would suggest is that you do a couple of different ones. Maybe don't just stick with one particular program so that you get a couple of different um, takes on that. Or maybe they show different things within their shadowing program. Uh, the other thing I wanna tell you is I've just recently heard that one of the programs the physician was telling people when they're listing their shadows shadowing experiences on their application that they are, um, I'm trying to move my monitor here, that they are just just to list the who you shadowed for, how many hours and the dates. Please don't do that. Please reflect in your shadowing experiences about what you learned or what you took away. It is vitally important for the schools to know that, especially if that's your only medical exposure that you have. I'm really sorry about my light, it's driving me nuts. Um, so other than the shadowing, think outside the box. COVID testing centers, um, people who are at doors taking temperatures. They see that every clinic that I go to, there's somebody taking my temperature. They are also doing that at stores and hotels. Go see if you can volunteer for that. Um, it's community service, it's helping out uh, your community, it's helping out that business. Um, the other thing is, is think about online mentoring and online tutoring. There are some school districts that are still taking that right now because they still are online and they need help. If you can do that in a low, a low socioeconomic school district, a school district that has a high percentage of free or reduced lunches, that's gonna fall in the underserved category. What is it that those children are, um, what are the challenges that they're having? Can you imagine being in a household that doesn't have internet and your whole school went to online learning? The disadvantages of that student and how far behind they could possibly fall. <clears throat> so that's an idea. <coughs> Google search what you can do online. You would be amazed what you can find. There is a texting hotline. It's a crisis line that is up and running in Seattle for sure. <coughs> I think Portland as well. Um, we There may be one in the, um, Central Washington, I'm not sure. But find out about those kind of opportunities, the stuff you can do from home. It's You don't have to be in person anywhere. It's safe. Um, and that provides mental health support, which right now during COVID is, is terrible. There's really, really lack of access to care to mental health providers. And with people being isolated to their homes, that has raised a lot of mental health issues. So that's a good idea. Think about meals and groceries, delivering those for elderly people or vulnerable populations that cannot get out because they are too vulnerable to COVID. That might be a way that you could help. <clears throat> But really, the bottom line is you're going to have to think outside the box to get some experiences during this, this time frame. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's see here. Okay, so what happens to your application once you submit it to the big MCAS box in the sky? Uh, once it goes through MCAS, they will verify your, um, your transcript, and then they'll send it to the schools that you're asking them to send. The admission cycle starts May 1st. It goes live June 1st. We typically see our first applications come in the first or second week in July. It takes about that month for your secondaries to get to you and you get your back um, if you submitted very, very early. <clears throat> Once we receive it, 
it goes through two human being screeners and their job is to um, suggest that you come in for an interview or not. Uh, once you get invited to an interview, then your application will be reviewed again after your interview by two admissions committee members. Um, after all that's done, then your package goes to the admissions committee where one of those admission committee members will present you a admissions committee and everybody gets the same presentation time. They'll just kind of walk through your application, say what your strengths are, um, how well you did in your interview, those kind of things. <clears throat> and then we start making offers uh, typically in late fall, early winter, and we make offers all the way through March um, 15th. That's when we have to have filled our class, uh, but that class is not stable. So we have what's called a catch rate of two to one. That means that we make about two offers for every one seat in our class. Um, applicants can hold offers at multiple schools if they have multiple offers, but on um, April 15th, they have to narrow that down to three schools and on April 30th, they have to narrow it down to one school. So after those two dates, there's a big role in, in the admission cycle in which a lot of people are gonna come off a wait list during that time frame. Um, just because you submitted your application early does not mean that you will get an early interview. It doesn't work that way. Um, as you kind of go through <clears throat> the screening process, you're kind of ranked in that way. So you may not get an interview until later in the cycle. So don't panic if you submitted early, but you didn't, haven't heard anything. And we do kind of give updates along the way of where you're things like that. We don't tell you where you are on the wait list if you are on our wait list, but you are invited to be on our wait list. So if you've already gotten uh, offers at other schools and you've decided, I'm just not gonna go there, I, I, I wanna come off the list, then we'll just take you off the list at that point. <clears throat> um, that's kind of how it works. Uh, our deadline again, our primary is 15 August and our secondary is 1 December. <clears throat> and these are kind of some of those dates I talked about a little bit. Um, I don't think I, there's anything in here too much. FAFSA has to be done by 1 October of, let's see, yeah, 1 October of the application year. And that's so that you can qualify for scholarships within the WSU system as well as with, at the College of Medicine. And these are the statistics for our class that entered in 2020. And we get to these numbers by actually not looking at most of this information as we're going through the application. So um, we do seat 80 students per year. We typically get between 14 and 1500 applications a year. But of those only between, it's been between 720 and 740 that have qualified for secondary applications. And that means that either they applied and they didn't qualify with the GPA and MCAT scores, or they weren't state residents and they applied anyway, thinking that we just might look at their application <clears throat> or maybe their letters of recommendation didn't get in time. Um, we typically interview 350, that's what we did last year. And um, of the statistics, it says 91% were um, state residents, but that just means that the other uh, percentage had ties to the state of Washington. 25% of the class that came in 2020 was from a rural county in Washington. 30 were from a rural county um, somewhere in the, in the United States or, or outside the states. 10% were military, 25% were reapplicants. So if you have to reapply, know that we look at your application the same. You are going to have to answer an extra question of what have you done since you last applied, and you want to make sure that you've done stuff since you've last applied. Uh, whether that went from part-time to working full-time, um, you should have some new experiences in that year, but you should certainly continue to get medical exposure and do community service because we will be looking for that. Um, it is very common to have to reapply to medical school. So if you apply and you get denied, please don't let that absolutely um, just tear you down. It is very normal. Only about 48% of people get into medical school each year. Uh, what I will tell you, and knock on wood, please listen to this if you don't listen to anything else. When you apply to medical school, as soon as you hit go to all of your applications, give yourself a break for about two weeks. Then take a breath, stand back up, and keep doing those things that you were doing before to prepare for medical school. Because what happens, <clears throat> a lot is that people are waiting, they're like, oh, I applied, I don't have to do anything. And they don't get notification that they were denied until March or April. And then you're applying one month later and you don't have any time to get new things to put on your application. So please don't do that. 
continue to do the things that made you competitive to begin with. Um, our average age is 26 in our class, which tells you right off the bat that people are taking gap years or they're changing careers as well. Very common to take gap years. We do not look at your application any differently if you took gap years. Uh, what we do look for is what did you do during that time? Um, were you studying for the MCAT? Were you taking that time to get those experiences that are going to make you competitive? You know, did you take a mission trip, study abroad, whatever that is. <clears throat> we don't like to see that you just traveled for leisure for one or two years, which, you know, some people get to do. We do think that you should rest during that time frame if that's one of the purposes for taking gap years, but just make sure that you're doing those activities to make you competitive. 56% um, are non-traditional, which means they're over 25 or they're career changers. And then 60% were females. We cannot look at age, gender, sex, um, or uh, ethnic background at all when we're looking at our applications. All of that information is blinded for us. So this is all just happenstance that this happened. Almost 34% are first generation college students and around 14% for that class had advanced degrees. Advanced degrees don't make you more competitive. It just gives you different experiences to draw on. <clears throat> Some people had to get an advanced degree to qualify for the GPA MCAT um, threshold. So that's where some of that comes in. Uh, most important numbers I think for you guys to think about right now is these bottom numbers, the uh, overall GPA. <clears throat> so our overall GPA um, average is 3.62. Uh, national average is about 3.8, but it's the range that I want you to look at. The range for students in the class that came in in 2020 were 2.64 to 4.0. So there are medical students in medical school that had an overall GPA of 2.6. And that should give any of you that have had some little struggles within college or maybe things didn't go exactly how you wanted, should give you hope that we do actually say do what we say we would do. Uh, the MCAT's the same way. Our range is 497 to 520. Uh, there are people that have a low 27% MCAT score, but they had a, a really good GPA. Um, and so by not looking at those scores, we still ended up here. And that should give people hope who thought, oh gosh, I failed a class somewhere in my time. I'm never gonna get in medical school. Simply is not true for our school. <clears throat> okay. And the rest of my slides are just our learning spaces up in Spokane if you've never been up onto our campus. This is our anatomy lab. We have three rooms exactly like this. There's 16 tables in each room. The walls all the way down both sides of all of our rooms are all whiteboards because our students tend to study out loud and written down. And it's a good way for them to think together. Um, we have um, high-tech surgical lamps for the cadaver uh, tables, which is really nice so you can see well. And then smart boards at the end of each <clears throat> table as well so that you don't have to take your lab manual in. The instructor can be in the front of the room and tell you what, what you're supposed to be looking for, project it out onto your TVs. You can also project your lab manual up onto those TVs. And so just another picture of the lab. Our medical students have 24 hour, seven day a week access to the anatomy lab. And we have our own cadaver program um, at WSU Spokane. <clears throat> this is our um, virtual center. We have three different theaters in here which have really highly specialized computerized mannequins within there. So our medical students can practice procedures on a um, model that they can't hurt, which is very comforting to most medical students, especially when it comes to things like surgery and giving, um, uh, having a baby, which we have a mama that gives birth to that baby, uh, which is super cool, by the way. Uh, and there's um, two-way windows and stuff to be watched. They have, they take tests in here as well. And within this center are exam rooms in which they will do standardized patient exams. That's patients we pay uh, to, to act the same way for each medical student. So they're all getting the same um, experiences. And also there's a test called the OSCE, which is a, <clears throat> it's a test of actually performing clinical skills. Uh, and they do that within these, this space as well. All right, that was me talking really, really fast. And now I am open for questions for anything that it did not um, answer. And I see, what does the term childhood mean? So on AMCAS, it's going to ask you what your childhood address was. So it's basically where you spent the majority of your time as, as a child, the, the longest address likely that you had as a young child. So prior to high school graduation, if you think about that. Any other questions?
Hi, Lynn. Um, Hi, Andrew. Uh, thanks for uh, coming in uh, today and speaking to us. Um, uh, so I have two questions. One is about the application process. I'm kind of curious um, about the, the personal statement and in terms of like how how likely is it to, to, I guess, break somebody's application? I mean, considering, you know, they're a well-rounded candidate, because I feel like there's a lot of pressure since that's the, the first impression to kind of, you know, make your your story compelling and what whatnot. But I mean, assuming you're a well-rounded candidate and you may not be the best writer or whatever, and you don't stand out, I mean, are you likely, how do, how, how likely is it to impact, I guess, your... Okay, so you're, you're wanting to know kind of um, if we're looking at how much impact does just the personal statement have? Is that kind of what you're asking? On a yeah, yeah, question? probably. Yeah, I, I think that's a good way to sum it up. Thank you. Okay, so for, for us, your application, there's not one part of your application necessarily that's going to wait more, um, but... Most medical schools put some stock in that personal statement. And here's what they're looking for. If you can think about this as you're writing, you know, you don't have to be some literary wizard to write a personal statement. If that is not how you speak and that is not how you write, then you should write how you do it. What we're trying to get out of that personal statement is who are you as a person? And then when we're done reading it, we should know beyond the shadow of a be a physician. Not that you want to be a PA, not that you want to be a nurse, not that you want to be another healthcare professional. So <clears throat> what we tell people is it's a living story, first of all. When you're talking about your path to medicine, whenever that started, what were the things that you did along the way that helped you to, to solidify that decision? So there should be concrete examples of things you have done that help support what you're saying um, either your path to medicine was or what you plan to do. And that helps that statement be more solid. I caution you on researching online for personal statements. If you choose to do that, please read them with a grain of salt and know that that is someone else's personal statement, someone else's life. So you don't have to, if, if you're not a witty person, then your personal statement doesn't have to be witty. It should be sincere. It should tell us, what have you done? Like, where did your motivation start? What got you interested in pursuing to be a physician? And then along the way, how did that increase? What are the things that added to your motivation for medicine? Um, <clears throat> when I've read a personal statement and I get to the bottom, I'm like, I have no idea why they're going into medicine. That's a bad day. That's a bad, bad day for that person because likely if they didn't say it there, it's also not going to be in other places in their application. Um, so I wouldn't, don't stress yourself out about being perfect. Be yourself in these personal statements, but make it clear why you want to be a physician. And it should never just be these two things. I like science and I like people because you can be a biologist and you can be a counselor, you can be a social worker, you can be all kinds of things where you like people or you help people. It needs to specifically address why you want to be a physician. And that, that is a place where some people get a little bit off track because they're a little bit too general. Um, so think about that as you're going through. Read some examples. Um, you, I know that you guys have some good advisors where you are because I work with them all the time. Um, ask them to read your personal statement. Ask them what they think and see, you know, can you tell that I want to be a physician? Is it clear? What do I need to add? Where are my gaps? And then the secondary essays are important to schools because they're wanting to see those concrete examples of what you've done to align with their missions. Okay. Does that help? Oh yeah, for sure. That, that helps a lot. I appreciate that. Thank you. Perfect. And then uh, my second question is more specific to the program. Um, Cause I know that there is a nutrition program that's on campus. I was wondering um, how integrated the medical program is uh, with the nutrition program. Cause I know that, that, that seems to be something that's lacking a lot in ND programs, so. You would be right about that because they can only fit so much stuff into the curriculum. Um, so NAP is part of the College of Medicine in that they fall under the College of Medicine. But as far as interaction, we have some interprofessional activities that occur um, 
you know, during your time at medical school, but they aren't really part of the curriculum per se. Uh, they don't have a lot to do with that. Um, I always tell people if that's a degree that you're interested in, it's a great degree to get your bachelor's in to then come into medical school because you've got the physiology part behind it or the physical part behind it and the nutrition part behind it. So if that's something that you're interested in, it is a great degree for that. Um, we, I mean, I work with, so Jill Wagner is from the NET program and she, we normally recruit together, quite honestly. And um, I foresee that there might be some interaction in the future coming from that. If we do have a lecture on um, nutrition, it is coming likely from one of the staff from the NET program because we do, inter not all of our physicians or all of our instructors are, you know, right within the, the MD program that we get them from other places as well and in the community too. So, I mean, they're faculty, but NEP is part of our faculty anyway, so. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from people? Happy to field anything. I actually have a quick question. Okay. So I am hoping to apply to med schools this coming summer. And I'm going through the process of the MCAT and I notice, so I try to do some research, um, but I just get a little confused. So I attached a link in the chat and was wondering if that, if you could confirm that that's the link to get registered for the MCAT. I can already tell you it is. The MCAT is through the AAMC website. So um, <clears throat> I'm not sure what happens if I open it here. Let me look, look take a, but yes, this is exactly it, where it says register for the MCAT exam. That is exactly where you go. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. I'm already there. Good, that's a good question. And honestly, the AAMC website, it's an enormous website, but if you have not spent much time on that website, I really, really implore you to do that. It has a ton of information and it's got a lot of, things that um, are written by current medical students, like what's the first year like? What was it like to apply to medical school? There's all kinds of stuff on there, but it is also the website that holds the MCAS application system. So you have to go onto it for that and you have to go onto it to register for your MCAT. So it has a, um, there is a guide, it's, you can download it in PDF form on step-by-step -step of how to fill out your application, what each section is about and what they're looking for. And then there's study materials for the MCAT within the WMC website as well. Some cost money, some are free. Um, you know, there's there's just a ton of information there. Let's see, MCAS opens in, deadline says that MCAS opens in October. Can we start applying even if we've not taken the MCAT yet? Uh, I'm a little bit confused about that, Jesus. What do you, so the application system opens May 1st through MCAS. <clears throat> you can start inputting your information into the system. Um, you can't send it to any schools until June 1st. So there's like this long month of being able to put all your um, transcripts and your information and your experiences and write your personal statement, all that stuff. Um, so you can start sending it as of June 1st and you can send it to schools all the way through um, October 15th. For us now, that is school specific. Different schools have different deadlines, so make sure that what schools you're applying to, you know what their deadlines are because they change, especially for the secondaries. So, I hope that that clears that up. So we're we're getting ready. We're at the tail end of this last year's. There's AMCAS is closed for this year. We're getting ready to go into our next cycle um, in May. <clears throat> it's a really long process. It's a year and a half, and and we know there's a lot of waiting and. There, there, we can't even, we sympathize, you know, with you all for sure, um, but just know that it's long. And if you go into it saying, okay, there's going to be lots of waiting and I'm just going to wait through it, it'll help you not get so anxious. Did that answer your question? Yes, Susan. Yes, perfect. All right. Other questions? Uh, yeah, I had one. So okay. regarding the letters of kind of recommendation, mm -hmm. would those be submitted through the AA MC like as well or? There is, there is a, um, there's a portal that you will sign up for 
And that is where your letters will be submitted to. You will not get to see your letters. So you will give that portal information to your letter writers. If you print out that form letter, I believe it's on there, um, but look that up to get it. Um, you, then your letters go in and they're just held. So as soon as they start writing them, they can submit them. Yeah, they may get your letter letters written and submitted before you even start putting your application stuff in, but it, there's a holding system for those. There's two different systems depending on which um, schools you're applying to. If, it, if you're applying to a DO school, it's a different system. DO schools are a completely different application system, by the way. Um, so the AMCAS is strictly for MD schools across the nation. Um, if you happen to be from Texas originally or you're wanting to go to any Texas schools, that is also its own application system because Texas has so many medical schools. So they have their own system, DO schools have their own system, and then MD schools have their own system. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Anything else? I have a quick question. Okay. Um, so I, sorry, <laughs> I know that money talks can be like a taboo subject, but how, um, how does affordability look like at your medical school? Okay, um, money talks are not taboo. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've got a question, ask it. So let's let's go off the shoot with this. <clears throat> the good majority of people attending medical school are taking out student loans. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is, is that you likely will not hold a job while you're in medical school. And that is because we want you to graduate. We want you to graduate on time. And we want you to be as less stressed as possible. So therefore, most people take out student loans. You have to look at medical school tuition and, and the loan process a little bit differently than you do undergraduate. And that is the earning potential on the other side of school. So <clears throat> our tuition is sitting around $37,000. It's a little over $37,000 a year. The cost of attendance is around 51 or 52,000. It may have gone up a little bit, I'm not sure. Which means kind of your living experience, expenses and you know gas, housing, stuff like that. A chunk of people take out enough loan to cover all of that each year. There are scholarships that are attached to the College of Medicine. Um, if you fill your FAFSA out, you are also entered into the WSU General Scholarship Fund. There are scholarships that are um, topic specific. So kind of like when you apply for scholarships in undergraduate, maybe you were part of, or your parents were part of, maybe the Elks or the Moose um, organizations and they had a scholarship to offer. Maybe you were in sports or arts and there was a scholarship for that. There's scholarships that are, that are specific. There are also donors to the medical school that set up very specific scholarships. We just had one um, that started this last year for if you promised you would be a primary care physician in a rural environment, it was an $80,000 scholarship, um, which was a really good scholarship. Um, so each year there's different ones like that. But the shortest residency is primary care. It is three years. When you're in residency, you are getting paid. So you're getting paid somewhere between fifty-five dollars and $65,000 a year. You can put your undergraduate student loans on hold during that time. You can put your medical school um, loans on hold during that time as well. But graduating from a primary care residency after three years, your earning potential sits around $185,000 to $225,000 a year in, in the state of Washington. That is ample money to pay on those um, student loans that you took out. We also have on our staff, um, his name is Rich Ronstead, and he is a financial educator. He is a financial planner by trade, and he is assigned only to the medical students. His job is to contact you as soon as you get an offer to our school, help you set up a budget, help you decide what financial aid that you need, his goal for you, however, is to take out as least financial aid as possible so that you can pay it off quicker. And if he has his druthers, he will have your student loans paid off in 10 years. So he's very good at what he does and he's very tied with our students and he's free for you guys. So if you wanna live like a doctor while you're in medical school, your budget's probably gonna be a little bit higher. We don't recommend that, but it's your choice. It's your budget. He's not gonna tell you what you can, can and can't do. Um, oftentimes if someone has a family, if they have a significant other and or children, um, the significant other sometimes will not work either. 
And you're probably all thinking, oh my gosh, that must be an outrageous student loan. Um, but the truth is it's less stressful. Uh, daycare is expensive. So they, if they're working, they may only be working enough to pay for the daycare. And it provides a good support system for the medical student if their spouse is not also stressed by having to work. So we've seen it different ways. And we've seen people that have come through medical school with children coming in. We've seen people who have had more than one child during medical school um, and it is doable. And that's what I want you to walk away with. It is doable. Do not let the money be your stopping factor because money can be found. And even if you had to take out every single dime in student loans, it is possible. All right. Well, thank you. That answered my question. You're welcome. Any other questions? Oh, uh, Len, I had a, uh, a question about uh, residency matching. I was okay. wondering what it's like. I know you said that we didn't, uh, we, students aren't expected necessarily to go um, into family medicine or mm -hmm. uh, primary care. Um, but I was wondering, like, are there protected residencies for WSU graduates or anything like that? Or if no. people are matching into maybe some uh, higher demand uh, specialties that Washington State needs, you know, like uh, neurology or, you know, orthopedics or something, you know, stuff like that. So it's a good question, but we haven't graduated a class yet. <clears throat> so the match actually occurs in two weeks our first match. So <clears throat> we don't know where, where our students have matched yet. I will tell you that we did have early match. Um, there are some residency programs that their match is early and they are typically in um, things like ENT, which is a very competitive residency <laughs> program. And we did have student match in that. Um, so that's good news. Uh, but we won't have those numbers until you know later. I'm not sure when we get to publish them. Um, but our expectation is that our students will match. Every medical school um, often has, you know, one or two that maybe don't match, but we're, our, we're hopeful for our whole class. It'll be great if we all match, right? Um, but what I do know is that they have applied to a wide variety of specialties. Um, WSU, as far as having residencies that hold places for medical students, that's pretty rare. Um, UW has residency slots, but it, they, don't, they don't necessarily hold those slots just for UW students. Um, but we have started uh, some of our own residencies. We've got permission to do that. We've been accredited to do that. We have started one in Everett in um, internal medicine. And then I think the next one that's gonna open is primary care in Pullman. And we expect to grow that program so that we're increasing the slots in the state of Washington <clears throat> for some different specialties. Um, but typically you're gonna apply across the nation, right? For residencies and go where you can get in, where you match to and where you wanna go. Our hope is that you'll choose to come back to Washington to actually practice medicine if you have to leave the state. Um, <clears throat> I noticed there is a question that says, I understand there's some required courses. If we're not going to have those completed by the time we apply to the school, but we'll have it completed by the time we graduate, does that disqualify? No, it does not. You have <clears throat> until, <clears throat> excuse me, you have until July 15th of the year that you start school to complete those prerequisites. So, because you can be a junior in college and apply this cycle. So if you're a junior right now, you can apply in this cycle and you'll have an entire year of school left, but your bachelor's degree and your prerequisites need to be done by the 15th of July of 2022 if you're applying for this year. Okay, um, that answers that question. I have a real quick question on for building the network of like um, people you know, what, do you, what would you recommend is the best way students can go about uh, starting that? Do you mean <clears throat> for trying to like find shadowing or what do you mean by building the network? Uh, I would say, yeah, physician shadowing uh, people like outside of your um, uh, it, professors for like to use as letters of recommendation. Oh, okay, perfect. Um, <clears throat> so I've seen them come from um, some, like if you got to shadow <clears throat> say 40 hours, maybe you shadowed one physician for that long, you can ask that physician. Um, I always tell people if you're trying to start shadowing, you're trying to get some medical exposure, start close to home. Start with your own family physician. Start, maybe you've been seeing a specialist for something. Start with that physician. See if you can get a shoe in there and shadow that person. 
especially if you've been under their care, they already know who you are. They kind of know what your personality is like, right? So it, you don't want to just write or just ask your family physician to write you a letter if you haven't shadowed for them or worked under them or done something like that. Please don't do that. Um, but that's and, or then ask them, do you have any colleagues that maybe I could shadow or I could work under? And kind of branch out that way. If you have friends or family members of friends that are physicians, that's a great way to start and reach out. <clears throat> but I would look at the volunteer programs within each of the hospitals and clinics around where you live. Um, see if any of them are taking on volunteer services. Look for some of the things like free clinics <clears throat> because they do take volunteers and you'll get to know a lot of different health professionals that way. But it can also be uh, from a paid position that's not medical. It can be your supervisor from that position. It can be <clears throat> if you did sports, um, sports, art, dance, music, any of that during college, it can be <clears throat> your instructor for that. Um, let's see, where else have I seen letters? Obviously professors from different um, classes. Uh, I have seen church organizations, if you volunteered a lot in your church or <clears throat> you're a really active member in your church, I've seen it come from clergy as well or just your supervisor in that um, time frame. If you did things like summer camps and you did it more than once, it can be the volunteer coordinator for that, someone who knows you well in that. So just think of some of the activities that you're planning on putting on your application and think, if I've spent a good deal of time in that, would the person who was in charge of that activity it, would that be a good person for me to use as well? So it can be a lot of different ways. All right, thank you. You're welcome. All right, anything else? Um, I got a question about residency. Okay. So I remember you mentioned earlier that in Everett, uh, WC will be, I guess, opening like residency spots for mm -hmm. IM. Is that for like, let's say go like UW Medicine Am I able to like apply? Yes, for that it is. One? It's it is nationwide residency, so anybody can apply. Gotcha. And then um, my second question for rotations: Is that do you um, are the rotations only in Washington State, or do you place us like all across the nation? So okay, that's a that's a a twofold question. <clears throat> so our third year is not block rotations like a lot of medical schools are. Our third year is called a longitudinal integrated clerkship. And that means that you are assigned a, a cohort of patients and you'll follow those patients around to their specialty appointments rather than doing specific blocks. Your fourth year though is block rotations and there's a couple of required ones. I think ER is in your fourth year and then your rule or underserved block rotation is in your fourth year as well. It is your fourth year that people often apply to what's called away rotations. And that's where you go, maybe maybe there's a residency program that you wanna check out before you actually apply to it. So you apply for a way rotation there and those are called interviewing rotations as well. So you're kind of on your toes for the entire time that you're there, just so you know. Um, and yes, you can do those from our school as well. As far as the normal rotations in your third year, um, they are in the state of Washington with the exception of Portland because the Vancouver um, region goes, reaches down into Portland because they're so close in order for you to get all the experiences that you need and to experience different kinds of hospitals. Um, we have included that region as well. Um, if you are assigned to, let's say you're assigned to Everett, um, and I'm gonna use the Tri-Cities because it's a better example. If you're assigned to the Tri-Cities and you want to observe um, transplant, then you won't just be, um, you, won't, you don't have to do all of your rotations in the Tri-City region. And when I say Tri-Cities, it's like a, a fourth of the state. We divide the state up into quadrants for places. Um, you would have to come to Spokane or you would have to go to Seattle to see transplant. So we make sure that you get the rotations that you want to get. Um, and you can apply for those away rotations as well in your fourth year. So it just depends on what you're seeking. Asha, thank you, appreciate it. You're welcome. All right, anything else? All right, looks like we probably hit everything. Um, the link that I had put in there earlier is, like I said, if you are interested in talking to me one-on-one -on -one or you have some additional questions as you go forward, please fill that out and Maura will get you um, signed, signed up with one of our schedulers to get you some one-on-one -on -one time. Um, super happy to talk to you guys about anything all the way up until you submit your application. So feel free to reach out, you know, don't try to get 
information about admissions through the grapevine, contact the admissions offices of the schools that you're applying to and get the, get the information from the source so that it's accurate for you all. All right. Thank you for coming, Lynn. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. And again, if you need anything else or you want to have another session, you know, reach out if you have a specific topic that you want to um, cover. You know, we can talk about things in more detail, whatever you would like. And I yes. would the best. Yes, for sure. So um, just so everybody knows in the in the Zoom meeting right now, um, I'm more than open to setting up another meeting with Lynn if you are interested in setting up a meeting with if anybody wants to have like a, a smaller group to ask more questions to her if you have any like you know other pressing questions you know that you don't get to get to at this time and then um just so everybody knows like if you want to go and watch this again this is being recorded that we are going to post and then um we actually are having if anybody was interested in the nutrition program they are coming to speak mm -hmm. with us i believe next monday or this friday i have to double check next so monday next monday okay. yes so that's also something if you're you know i remember andrew speaking just briefly about that so if you know again mm -hmm. Yeah, it's always an option if you want to go to that event. But yes, if anybody wants to set up a, another meeting with Lynn, like please let me know, and then we can set that up so that you can we can have a little bit more of cohort of students so that you know people can get more information instead through the grapevine, like Lynn said. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And even if that's you know you say, hey, I want to talk more about the experience section and how to fill those out. What it, whatever that looks like, I'm happy to to help you wherever I can. Um, I with this recording, please. Um, Destiny, if you can, when you send that out, if you please put the caveat on it, that they need to check the website for dates and specifics, because the admissions committee meets in April to decide the cycle. So that's things like the MCAT, um, how far back we're going on the MCAT, if there's any changes in prerequisites, which I don't anticipate, but just in case, or if they're going to publish a different secondary question please tell them to double check information on the website before they apply. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I will do that. Thank you for, Thank I was you. thinking about doing it. Thank you for reminding me and kind of just a mental note for sure. I will put that on there for sure. That's the only thing that ever makes me nervous about recordings. It's like, oh heavens, don't just take that as gospel because things can change once the cycle opens. So Oh, I 100% understand. I 100% understand, especially with everything going on right now. I completely yeah. understand. Totally agree. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, y'all, I'm going to let you go, and I really appreciate your time here for you guys whenever you want help, um, and best of luck going forward. I wish you all really, really good luck. Thanks for coming. Thank you oh, so much. I, and I keep forgetting that you're, so WSU also has Honors College in Pullman, and I didn't talk about this. Um, I know that you don't have the branch um, on your campus, but there is an Honors College pathway to medicine as well. So if any of you are transferring for some reason to Pullman and you're interested in that, please let me know and I can talk to you that. Okay. See you later. All right. Thank you. Thank you.